Oh, let's let's give you one that works, huh? That blue one, the ball went flying recently. <laughs> okay, Max, go for it. Okay. On the count of three, we'll ring the bells 11 times. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. All right. Thank you all. Good morning, friends. Some of you, I can hear the sugar in your voice as you say good morning because you were over in the fellowship hall where we had a hot chocolate bar and hear the good news. We have a lot of leftover hot chocolate and toppings and cookies. And so we warmly invite all of you after service to go back and either have a second cup or a first cup or a third cup and enjoy uh, some homemade chocolate. We have dairy-free homemade hot chocolate, and we have fully loaded dairy hot chocolate. All right. If you're worshiping online, I hope that you make some hot chocolate wherever you are. Uh, tonight, we have our youth group Christmas party. I know they're looking forward to that. There's going to be a gift exchange. They're going to eat pizza. It will be fun. I'm looking forward to it. I know Megan and Kevin are as well. Um, I'm going to invite a couple of friends forward to, for some of our announcements. So Helen, if you want to go ahead and make your way forward, and Pat, if you want to go ahead and make your way forward, I'm going to keep doing announcements, but you all will come up and announce next in line. It's a full season in the life of the church right now. One of the things I want to let you all know about is our Christmas Eve plan for services. So we're going to have a 5.30 family Christmas Eve service that's Saturday night, and we'll have candle light at that service. It'll be about 45 minutes interactive. There'll be a story and a craft. It's going to be a special time together. And then at 7 o'clock, we're going to have our traditional Christmas Eve service, which will also have candlelight minus the craft. So if you're wanting the craft, come to 530 and then stay for 7 o'clock. Uh, but we look forward to these special services. Uh, we are not having service on Christmas morning on Sunday. We're going to worship together on Saturday night and we wish everyone a Merry Christmas and safe and blessed holiday wherever you may be on Christmas Day. But we warmly invite you back on Sunday New Year's Day for our 11 o'clock service. We'll celebrate communion together. We're going to have a little mini pageant while we sing We Three Kings. We're going to uh, chalk the doors. We're going to get star words for 2023. It's going to be a really special service um, and we hope that you'll make space in your life to worship on New Year's Day. Helen, would you come forward? And the week after New Year's is the 8th of January, and that's when afterwards we're all going to get together, and hopefully ahead of time you've read Autopsy of a Deceased Church. Very enlightening, very us. There are still a few copies over there. Um, due to cataract surgery last week, I ran home after running errands and made sure to read it. Well worth the read. Small but mighty. It's worth it. Other thing I wanted to share is I know that uh, those of you that get the share letter online know that my granddaughter and I participated in um, a function last Saturday, Shine and Inspire. Great, great uh, nonprofit organization helping children in the Mercer County area, um, particularly Hamilton and Trenton, who just just need a little, a little more than we are able to provide for our own, so Shine and Inspire helps with that. Um, something that any of us can do, an hour, I spent all three, Jordan was there spending all three, it was a great, great opportunity. Next, if you'll look in the pews, uh, look on the back of the pew in front of you, you will find both prayer requests and the new offering envelopes. Prayer requests we haven't used in quite a while. Uh, not everyone puts their prayer request online. If you have a special prayer request, you can just write it down and drop it in the offering plate, which leads me to the envelopes. 
uh, the Finance Committee, we got together, we came up with a new envelope, and really, if you wanted to, you could use it today. Um, those of you that have an envelope number, we ask that you put that on there, your name, and where, where your treasure should go. Uh, those of you who didn't get your envelopes today, if you'll see Gloria, she has them uh, anytime, any place. And those of you who are visitors, feel free. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Go ahead and come forward, Pat. Good morning. Tuesday, Tuesday, Benita and I went to Women's Space and we took gift cards of over $200 and also gifts that we had to estimate, which we estimated about $550, including the uh, gift cards. I just want to thank everybody for their generosity. It's very hard to estimate when you're standing there and they say, could you give us an estimated value of this? But uh, they were very appreciative. They thanked us for thinking of them. Also, uh, as a deacon, I want to thank everybody who helped with the um, reception Friday night for Sandy Newman. I really appreciate all your help and Christy and her family did too. Thank you. And we're grateful to have some beautiful flowers. Those white flowers there in the middle are from the memorial service on Friday for Sandy and we wanna recognize and honor her and her family in this time. Um, as we think into 2023, you heard Helen mention that we're going to have a, a conversation together after worship on January 8th, and we do have copies of that book she held up. If you haven't um, got that, that's a free book for you to pick up and read, but you're invited to the conversation. We're really just saying we want to talk about how things have been going. There have been changes. There have been um, conversations that the session has been having, but not necessarily the whole congregation, so we want to take the opportunity to hear from one another and hopefully um, get on the same page together as well. So I've invited um, a minister from the Presbytery. She preached at my installation service, the Reverend Larissa Kwong Obezia. She's going to be with us and help facilitate that conversation. So we look forward to that and warmly invite each and every one of you to stay after worship on January 8th. And then on Saturday, January 14th, our officers, our elders and deacons will be having a, a training day. And what what we're inviting is for anybody in the congregation to come for the morning part of that training. Um, my good, uh, good family friends of ours, the Reverend Gary Alloway, who's a pastor in Bristol, Pennsylvania, will be a special speaker at that morning for this time of training. And so I really want to encourage and invite um, every, every member of the congregation to come. Gary is a fantastic speaker and presenter. He's been doing really neat ministry in Bristol for the past 13 years where he lives with his family. And he has some really great insights and stories and encouragement to share as we think about what it means to do mission in our local community. So I would warmly invite the whole congregation to join us from nine to noon. We'll have some morning prayer, we'll have some coffee and pastries, and then he'll present in a very interactive way. And there'll be time for discussion with him as well as some discussion in small groups before for the, the noon hour. And on that note, we're going to continue with worship this morning. I would invite you all to stand as we once again sing our special Advent song, Light One Candle to Watch for Messiah. We're going to sing the song together, and then we'll have our Advent candle lighting. Light one candle to watch for Messiah. Let the light banish darkness. He shall bring salvation to Israel. God fulfills the promise. Light two candles to watch for Messiah. Let the light banish darkness. He shall feed the flock like a shepherd, gently.
gently leading them homeward. Light three candles to watch for Messiah. Let the light banish darkness. Lift your heads and lift high the gateway for the King of Glory. Light four candles to watch for Messiah. Let the light banish darkness. He is coming. Tell the glad tidings. Let your lights be shining. You may be seated. Go ahead. people from the ages of 2 to 80 years old were asked the question, what makes you feel connected? What makes you feel loved? From the voices of different generations, hear their answers. Handwritten notes. Keep on. Casseroles. Being invited. Reading a book together. The passing of peace. Family walks. Youth group. When I see my friends at preschool. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise phone calls. Making music with other people. Home cooked food. Belly laughs. Eye contact. Dinner parties. An inside joke. Hugs. And dancing with the partner in the kitchen. Today we light the candle of love as a reminder that from the very first generation, God has surrounded us with love. May this good news, these threads of love, not only weave deeper connections between neighbors, but shape our actions and allow us to see God more clearly. In a lonely world, let this light shine bright. From generation to generation, we are held in God's love. Thanks be to God for that good news. Amen. Amen. Max, can you take the microphone back to Maryland? Thank you. To Maryland. Thank you. Our opening hymn is from generation to generation, verse 4. To everyone here in the sanctuary and those at home, good morning. good morning. I want to wish you also a Merry Christmas. But more importantly, I want to wish happy birthday to Jesus. The call to confession. One of the greatest gifts and challenges of faith is that we cannot be Christian alone. We need one another. We need one another to grow. We need one another to love. And we need one another to see God more clearly. So together, let us lift our voices in unison. Let us lean into the ties that bind and pray to our merciful God. A prayer of confession. God of today and tomorrow, when Mary was pregnant and afraid, 
She ran to her cousin Elizabeth's house. Elizabeth threw open the door with joy, showered blessings upon her. How often do we have that same opportunity? How often do we leave the door locked, the curtains drawn, and the lights off? How often do we shower critique or judgment instead of blessings and joy? Gracious God, forgive us all our wrongs. We want to see you when we see our neighbor. Amen. Words of forgiveness. Friends, this is what I know. God delights in us. God throws open the door, just like Elizabeth, and says, come on home, there is room for you here. And in that moment, we are blessed. In that moment, we are forgiven. In that moment, we are seen, healed, and welcomed home. So rest in this good news, you are saved by grace. Let us respond together using the words from Mary's song. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Our response to praise is my soul cries out with a joyful shout.
All right, I'd like to invite the children forward before Children's Church. Hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. Hey, friends. I love seeing all the Christmas colors, all the red and Christmas dresses. Very cool. So behind where you're all sitting, we have special artwork for today. Does anybody have any idea of who is in this art? Micah. Um, an angel talking to Mary. An angel talking to Mary. What do you think? Uh, Joseph. Joseph. Well, you all are sort of close. What do you think? To Mary. To Mary, yes. Yeah. So Mary is in this photo. But the other person in this photo, this is Mary, and this person is Mary's cousin, Elizabeth. Yeah, so this is Elizabeth and Mary. So after the angel told Mary, you're going to bear God's son into the world. You're gonna be the mother of God. God has chosen you, you're so special. And remember we talked about Mary was a little bit scared, but the angel also gave her courage well, Mary had a really good idea. She decided, you know what? I'm gonna get some support. I'm gonna go to my cousin Elizabeth. She's older than me and she can help me know what to do. And the amazing thing about Elizabeth, Elizabeth was quite a bit older than her. She was past the time when normally you might get pregnant and have a baby, but Elizabeth was all of a sudden gonna have a baby too. So they were both pregnant. One was older, one was very young. We don't know exactly how old, but she was past the time that women normally are pregnant. Older than 40 is my guess, <laughs> but I don't know for sure. <laughs> Good questions. So they, Mary traveled to Elizabeth's house and Elizabeth gave birth to John the Baptist. Yeah, John the Baptist. And when John the Baptist was in Elizabeth's tummy and when Mary, who was pregnant with Jesus in her tummy, when they started coming together, John the Baptist leaped in Elizabeth's womb, and she knew there was something really special about Mary and the child that Mary was bearing. And do you know what Elizabeth did? She gave her all these blessings. They hugged and they were reunited, and Elizabeth just blessed and blessed and blessed Mary. And it made Mary feel so good to have that love and support from Elizabeth. And then Mary did something really amazing. We just sang a whole hymn based on a special hymn that Mary sang. It's a hymn that's been called the Magnificat. She used all these beautiful words going all the way back in the Old Testament scriptures that Hannah, who was also pregnant unexpectedly one time said. And it's all these words that we now look at as really, really, really revolutionary, like a big deal. Like those words that we sing, let the fires of your justice burn and tear the tyrants from their throne and the hungry poor will weep no more for the food they can never earn. All those things were based on Mary's song, the Magnificat. I have a piece of artwork. This is an artist who drew Mary and he took words from her song. Cast down the mighty, send the rich away, fill the hungry, lift the lowly. And do you see what she's doing? She's crushing a serpent and a skull. It's a sign of revolution. And do you know what? In the 1800s, the British authorities banned Mary's Magnificat from being read in church. It was that revolutionary and threatening to the powers that be. I didn't get that. Could you try again? <laughs> <laughs> Series at church, y'all. <laughs> and in the 1980s, in the country of Guatemala, they also banned the Magnificat from being read. And in the 1970s, when there was something called the Dirty War in Argentina, 
and there was a group of mothers whose sons had disappeared and probably it was that they were murdered by the government, they used Mary's prayer to stand for nonviolent resistance to the ruling powers. So Mary's prayer, after her cousin Elizabeth loved her and blessed her, Mary's prayer is really revolutionary. And she had something important that she knew about God and what God was going to do through Jesus. And sometimes we don't remember that prayer. And so we sang it today because this is the Sunday where we're remembering Mary and Elizabeth and Mary's prayer. And I want you to remember that God is on the side of the lowly and the poor, and God cares about that in the world, and that is part of why Jesus has come, is to make those things right that are wrong. And Mary's prayer reminds us that that's who God is. And you all get to go now for Children's Church with Miss Wendy and Mr. Kevin, and you're going to continue learning about God today, and I think they have something very special planned. All right? Thank you all. Get those coats. All right. And those who are here in the sanctuary, will you join me in prayer? God of all, we are a mixed bag of distracted and forlorn, eager and anxious. We hope that you might move through the obstacle course we build up around our hearts. Those obstacle courses made out of questions and defenses, God, would you douse us in your good news? For at the end of the day, all we want is to know that we are not alone, that you are always near. So knock on our door. Sweet talk that guard dog we place in front of our vulnerable hearts and come right in, God. Make yourself at home. Pull us close and tell us your story of unbelievable good news. We are listening. We are grateful. Amen. Friends, our scripture this morning comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 58. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to the, a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowly state of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Indeed, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has come to the aid of his child Israel in remembrance of his mercy. According to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy to her and they rejoiced with her. And now the choir is going to share an anthem with us and teach us to sing along too.
thank you, Pastor Shannon. If you turn to the next page in your bulletin, uh, Regina has very nicely included the words to our anthem in the bulletin today. And uh, the parts that you as the congregation are to sing or the refrain to Mary's song are bolded. And then uh, what we're gonna do before we start the anthem is the choir will sing the refrain once, you can hear what it sounds like, and then we'll ask you to do a practice run of singing the refrain, and then we'll start the anthem. So thank you very much. Okay. start the anthem and you can follow along in the bulletin and join in on the, bo the bolded parts. congregation. In their studies of American society, generational theorists Neil Howell and William Strauss have suggested that how one generation relates to the subsequent generation 
often dictates the prosperity or demise of the people as a whole. A generation that clings to power and seeks to preserve its own well-being at the cost of the young creates a crisis for the future. This got me to thinking about what might have happened if Elizabeth was left out of the Christmas story. Have you ever wondered what Mary's story would look like if her elder cousin Elizabeth had not been there for her? Our scripture text this morning picks up the story in Luke's gospel right after teenage Mary's astounding encounter with the angel Gabriel, who announces not only God's utter delight in her, but also that she has been chosen to be the mother of God. Young Mary responds courageously in the midst of her fear and uncertainty. Yet she doesn't waste any time in going with haste to visit her older cousin Elizabeth. We're not told the reason for the visit, but we know Mary stayed for three months. Now, if Luke, the gospel writer who we know was the beloved physician, would surely know that the first three months of a pregnancy are the most vulnerable time. They're also the time when morning sickness is most common. So we might wonder if Mary stays three months because it takes that long before she feels well enough to make the return trip. But what's so powerful is to consider how Elizabeth interacted with Mary during those three months they were together. Maybe we would be expecting Elizabeth to see herself as a mentor to the young girl, possibly offering her words of advice or encouragement. But really what we at least see recorded in the words of scripture is that Elizabeth plays the part of a joyful prophet who graces Mary with a twofold declaration of blessing. Filled with the Holy Spirit herself, Elizabeth prophesies what no one else outside of Mary and Gabriel know, what's not yet visible to the eye, that Mary is pregnant, and not only that, that she knows that God has chosen this poor, young, teenage girl to bring God's salvation into the world. But Elizabeth does more than just prophesy. She blesses the heck out of Mary. And by declaring both Mary and the fruit of Mary's womb blessed, Elizabeth sets off a string of blessings that weave all throughout Luke's birth story and brings an intensity to its tone of joy and delight and praise. Mary is blessed because despite all expectations, her social status has been reversed. She will be honored rather than shunned and shamed for bearing this child. And she has also been blessed with divine joy, with beatitude, because Mary has believed that God is able to do what God promises to do. And there's Elizabeth standing next to her, also miraculously pregnant, but nevertheless ready and eager to celebrate Mary's willingness to say yes to God. And by posturing herself this way, Elizabeth is overturning the social expectations of their day. By opening her arms, opening her home to a relative whom her neighbors would expect her to reject, Elizabeth continues the pattern of social reversal. She welcomes Mary, and then she treats Mary as more honorable than herself. 
And then it's as if Elizabeth's treatment of Mary unlocks Mary's own lips, prompting her to find the beautiful, radical, revolutionary words to burst into song, celebrating God's new work in her and in the world. Without her encouragement, without her encounter from Elizabeth, Mary might not have possessed the confidence to envision the scope of God's new salvation. How marvelous. This story, this relationship between young Mary and elderly Elizabeth, I think it gives us a vision for the importance of intergenerational relationships in the church and in the community. Elizabeth's praise and blessing, her welcoming, her celebration of Mary can show those of us in the church who find ourselves more in line with Elizabeth's old age. We don't know exactly how. Micah asks, is it 40, maybe more? Many of us find ourselves more in line with Elizabeth's age, right, rather than Mary's youth. And perhaps Elizabeth shows us a way to cross generational boundaries. Developmentally, youth are capable of extraordinary commitment to someone who believes in them. They're capable of ridiculous fidelity to a cause that is worthy of their total commitment. You see, God didn't choose a teenager to bear salvation into the world by accident. Who else would agree with such a plan? And there's Elizabeth, who intuitively seems to know this and does everything she can to bless and celebrate and support Mary's yes to God. Elizabeth shows us what can happen when we can find it in ourselves to joyfully bless the youth in our midst, for they are precisely the ones God has created to have the developmental capacity to say yes to the kind of radical, upside-down, revolutionary ways of God in church and world. Clearly, if God had no qualms about making the most profound request in human history of a teenager, then who's Elizabeth to quarrel? She makes no hesitation in pouring out blessing on Mary. And we ought not hesitate either. I think Elizabeth can teach those of us who are in positions of elder wisdom. We are called to celebrate the gifts of the young and encourage their prophetic witness to God's work in the world. Rather than recoiling in fear and defensiveness when a new generation sees God's will at work in a new way, we can learn from the delight and from the wisdom of Elizabeth. And like her, we can lift our megaphones, not only to bless them, but to show the community that we stand firmly and proudly with young people in their cheering corner. Let's not forget that Mary, like the youth of today, she was too young to have had much time to achieve anything to really base her identity on. And that work of adolescence is to obtain a coherent sense of self so that you can then navigate future stages of life successfully. So when Elizabeth sees something in Mary that echoed for Mary what had only been revealed to her by the angel Gabriel, that Mary is favored by God, Mary becomes emboldened to trust not only that God's wild about her, but also that God has a radical plan of salvation because God's also wild about the whole world. Let's consider that Mary and Elizabeth, think about that. Think of that significant time they spent together. Those three months were surely an intensive period for them to forge a strong relationship. Just as Mary's body was adjusting to a flood of hormonal changes in those months, it kind of reminds me of 
all that we're feeling as a church in the midst of all the changes going on today. It's a time in our world of changing racial demographics, challenging the traditional understanding of white supremacy in our country. Generational changes are impacting church attendance, provoking questions around things as diverse as worship styles to leadership styles to what a meaningful mission looks like. Increasing numbers of people reject rigid binaries around gender and sexuality that were once just the accepted norms. All this and more can cause churning stomachs and unsettled hearts and minds. Many of us, if we're honest, we may feel a bit queasy while absorbing Mary's words of some people being brought down from positions of privilege while others are lifted up so that true beloved community can be formed. You know, when you feel sick, we generally take that as a sign that something is wrong. And we wanna do whatever is possible to get rid of whatever is causing us to feel ill. We all know churches that have closed, churches that are about to close because they would rather die than live through uncomfortable changes. The time that Mary shared with Elizabeth likely involved its share of discomfort. But it was also a generative space. It was pregnant with hope, with the future, with Christ our Lord. And there was Mary seeking out Elizabeth because she needed her. But Elizabeth also needed Mary. There's Elizabeth, closer to most of us in the pews today than Mary was. And perhaps we might say that Elizabeth's generation is aging without birthing the new children we might have hoped would carry the church forward for us. By the numbers, we might say the church of Elizabeth is barren. But this story in scripture sees it differently because it shows us that Mary and Elizabeth are carrying the future together. In God's mercy, one generation needs the other. As our Advent series proclaims in this fourth week, we see God in each other. You see, there is new life that has also taken flesh in Elizabeth's aging body. And that new life is intimately connected to the embryonic hope in Mary's body, and Elizabeth can feel it in her own belly. Do you know the feeling in yours? If not, would you, would our church be willing to build relationships with the youth of today, whether they're in our church or our youth group or our surrounding community? Because here's the thing, we need one another. God's way always involves us coming together. And here's a takeaway for those of us who find ourselves in Elizabeth's generation. While both women are bearing new life, both of them are bearing new life, Elizabeth privileges the younger Mary's pregnancy. Elizabeth prioritizes Mary's need for hospitality and sanctuary. And perhaps most importantly, Elizabeth shows a preferential option for Mary's voice and vision over her own. In doing this, perhaps she is modeling a way forward for the generations of Elizabeths in the church. Sometimes, perhaps the thing most needed is to stand down, to sit down, to be quiet, not so that we don't need each other, but so that the voices and the visions of younger generations might be heard. 
those revolutionary new hymns that are ready to be sung. May we together find new ways to embody the wisdom and the grace of Elizabeth. Amen. I would invite you to join in this affirmation of faith. It's been written for us to say together in light of our Advent series. It's there in the bulletin and on the screens. Will you join me as we proclaim the faith together? We believe that creation is inextricably linked. We belong to one another in an undeniable way. We are bone of bone and flesh of flesh, life breathed into dust. We believe that God invites us to live into that truth, to love without abandon, to see the good in one another, to trust that all belong to God. We know that this life of connection is easier said than done which is why we gather in this space week after week, generation after generation, to be reminded we see God in each other. This we believe, amen. The call for offering. The offering plate is at the sanctuary door when you enter or exit the church. You are welcome to mail your check to the church. You are also invited to give online through our website secure donate now option. The prayer of dedication. Holy one, this Advent season we wait with love and we give with love. Love for you our God, love for you our the people. Receive these generous offerings and use them for your works of love in our world. Amen. Will you pray with me? God of yesterday and God of tomorrow, from the very beginning, you gave us the gift of relationships. From the very beginning, you tucked us into communities. From the very beginning, you wired us for connection. From the very beginning, you made our hearts capable of love. Thank you. This gift of relationship has led us to people who lead us to you, and we are better for it. So today, we want to say thank you for our Elizabeths, for the people who have thrown open the doors for us, who revel in our joy, who point out your presence in our lives, and who are quick to affirm us and call us blessed. Those people come in many shapes and sizes. For some of us, the Elizabeths in our lives are family members, parents and grandparents who have cheered us on along the way, for others, teachers and coaches, neighbors and scout leaders, professors and counselors come to mind. And we can't forget the way our chosen family, friends and partners have been like Elizabeth for us. These people have reminded us what love looks like in a hurting world, which has pointed us back to you. Oh, and God, as we think of this hurting world, this world that you know and love in our longing to heal and bring salvation, we remember those right now in our lives, in our church, in our community, those who need your presence, who need your hope, who need your healing touch. So we lift them right now to you silently in our hearts, and we also lift them aloud by name. We remember Colton and Brody and Joan and Carl, the family of Sandy, the family of Jean, Ted and George, Bill, baby Liliana, Thelma and Linda. 
And today, God, we ask, we ask you for your help in opening our eyes even more. Oh God, we want to see you. We want to see you in those who love us well and in those who don't. We want to see you in those whose coffee order we have memorized and in those we've never talked to. We want to see you not only in those who are family who look like us or think like us, but those who come from very different places and positions in life. God, from generation to generation, you've left your fingerprints all over creation. Help us to be like Elizabeth, to see and celebrate glimmers of your good news in all walks of life. With hope, we pray together the words of Jesus, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our closing hymn this morning is a familiar tune. The tune is, Come, Thou Fount of Every Blessing. The words are different, but so meaningful. They've been written by Amanda Udis Kessler, who has written them as a queer Christian for us to sing together as one family of God. The song is, We Belong to One Another. Let's sing it together. As you get ready to leave this place or go get some more hot chocolate, go with this blessing. Go knowing that from generation to generation, we have been claimed and loved. From generation to generation, God has been by our side. From generation to generation, we are not alone. The God of yesterday and the God of tomorrow knows you by name, loves you and calls you forth, saying, go be the person you are called to be. Love wildly, do justice, and come back soon. May it be so. Amen.